Hi, John. How's it going? Ed, how's it going? I'm hanging in there. Me too. <laughs> By my thumbs, it feels good. Hello. Hello. Hi. Greetings. Hi, Doug. Hi, Doug. Hello, Hello everyone. Hi, Margo. Hi, Amanda. Hi. Mark was here. He said he'd be right here. Speak of the devil and up he pops. I think this is everyone who indicated they would join us. Uh, Tina commented on the thread, but then said she was uh, going to be working today. So if you'd like to get started, Amanda. <laughs> you just you scared her. Her. <laughs> By the way, can we welcome Amanda? I don't think I've met her. Oh, yeah. That was a, that was a hell of a... A little uh, courteous. Okay. <laughs> Hi, Actually, Amanda. I was closing uh, windows, and then I closed this window. Uh, okay. we, we, I, Amanda and I have spoken before. And, uh, oh, I've, I've not met Amanda, Amanda before, so welcome aboard. Thanks. I, yeah, I, I just finished reading the um, suggested reading, so I'm fascinated by this topic. It's a big one, Yeah. <laughs> which I'm sure you guys are used to dealing with. We are. Uh, we, we are dealing with. <laughs> Yeah, we're, we're dealing. Yeah. <laughs> it, yeah, it's a very challenging topic. It, it seems to be getting bigger and bigger every day. As a matter of fact, mm. every time I visit the bookstore, I see another book that has to, that demands my attention. So mm. I think yeah, working on this. Yeah. So I had made a bunch of notes when we were originally supposed to do this a month ago. And I went to grab them this morning and I couldn't find them. So it'll be probably a little more free, free flow than I had intended. But that's good, too, because since it is such a big topic, sometimes questions and answers are a good way to get started. Um, but because I haven't really attended one of these, is there a typical flow or is this usually just like an open discussion or is there a usual? Well, it helps sometimes to orient us around an issue. We have some seed questions and then we... Um, let a person who's, you know, like yourself, who's like sort of expert in this area or has a special interest to, uh, you know, make a, make a case for whatever she's interested in exploring and um, offering some orienting frameworks. Okay. And then they have like a free for all. And, right. uh, and that's where all the, the fist fights break out. <laughs> and some of us has to become a referee. And then we sort of settle into uh, what happens next, you know. That's my. That's way I, what I take away from these cafes. It's sort of a, an open-ended conversation that keeps on going. Okay. But um, others, I have to come I to I I'm sorry. You have another description. That's cool. I, Marco, I didn't hear you interrupt. Oh, I just said that it doesn't have to come to fisticuffs. No, <laughs> no, no. no. We, we we can behave. <laughs> well, I mean, if it comes to fisticuffs, I'll I'll probably just like nod and smile at you a lot. <laughs> um all right well that said i mean what comes to my mind is to start off with are there any specific questions that anybody has at this point just so that i can kind of like get those in my mind um i do have some of a, somewhat of a framework that i normally use when talking about this material but i'm curious about what y'all are interested in yeah uh -huh. I actually uh, did all the homework and uh, revisited and checked out your website. And I explored this subject topic about 10 years ago with Brian Weiss. And then another, I'm curious if you know, uh, Sabrina Lucas, mm -hmm. she's a 
Jungian trained. She actually trained in Zurich, uh, past life. Uh, what's her book called? Past life dream work. Okay. So I'm not sure where you want to focus. If it's on the planetary, what's the guy's the guy's name? Who, yeah, that or on your specific, you know, area of. Okay. So, so so it sounds like you're getting more of the the Brian Weiss thread is more of the past life work thread, um, and I don't think that that's initially what like spawned this conversation. Um, but if there's time, I'm happy to kind of like loop that in or like if we just naturally devolve into that conversation, <laughs> we can go there. Um, cause it is linked, but I made a note of her name. So thank you for that. Anything else from anyone well, uh, else? In that, um, that essay, uh, I read a, I've seen other of his talks and I read one of his books. Um, I'm very interested in the um, the clash uh, between cultures, um, the magical and the mythical, and the, the current uh, scientific paradigm, which is in sort of crisis because there are different uh, deficient forms, and uh, there are efficient forms, as our uh, uh, Gebser would say of the rational, the mental structure. And the mental structure seems under a great deal of stress right now. And I think the, the Tarnas is focusing on the postmodern trends right. and how um, the postmodern has opened up this uh, look at, looking at the features and the cracks in the, in the foundation of the rational, which rides upon the magical and the mythical waves, mm -hmm. which yeah. uh, it tends to repress and forget about or uh, you know, actively attack. And I think this is the, the, the area that interests me the most. Okay. So that seems like a really good launching off point actually. Um, Cause I think what I'll do is just kind of break down, give you a little bit of info just about how I understand the progression of Richard Tarnas's work and why it came about. And then we'll talk about those, you know, what he would call the two main modern paradigms. Um, and then talk about the third that comes in there um, and see what happens from there. But I think I was going to read a paragraph first, but I think I'm going to switch to another one that just more directly addresses what you were just saying. Um, it is in the reading that I, that we posted for you guys. Um, I just realized that that essay that's posted online is it's an excerpt from the book Cosmos and Psyche but that chapter in the book is a little bit different. Um, it's arranged differently. So the paragraph I want to read is this. I believe that the disenchantment of the modern universe is the direct result of a simplistic epistemology and moral posture spectacularly inadequate to the depths, complexity, and grandeur of the cosmos. To assume a priori that the entire universe is ultimately a soulless void within which our multidimensional consciousness is an anomalous accident, and that purpose, meaning, conscious intelligence, moral aspiration, and spiritual depth are solely attributes of the human being, reflects a long invisible inflation on the part of the modern self. And heroic hubris is still indissolubly linked, as it was an ancient Greek tra tragedy, to the heroic fall. And then skipping forward just a little bit, what is the cure for hubristic, hubristic vision? Is it perhaps to listen, to listen more subtly, more perceptively, more deeply? Our future may well depend on the precise extent of our willingness to expand our ways of knowing. We need a larger, truer empiricism and rationalism. All right. So just a bit about so when we're studying like Richard Tarnas's archetypal cosmology and things like that, it's the basic premise is that it's really important for us to always study context and lens. And that's true in like our personal narratives and in our cultural narratives and in history as well. And so in order to do that, you kind of have to study the evolution of human thought. And so as I understand it back in the seventies, um, Richard Tarnas and Stanislav Grof, 
uh, Groff being a kind of like philosophical psychotherapist and Tarnas being a cultural historian philosopher, um, were doing they were doing research at Esalen, which is an institute in Northern California that's kind of like hippie dippy woo woo stuff. Uh, but they were doing research specifically using hallucinogens, um, and they were including astrological transits in the mix. Okay, so they were just kind of seeing like <laughs> they were trying to study like the reflective dynamics of astrology. Um, so this isn't the idea that like the planets are causing anything to happen, but it's the idea that the planetary bo- bodies kind of reflect what's going on, like like a clock reflects the time, right? Like a clock doesn't cause time to happen. It's just reflecting something. Um, and they were uncovering a lot during that time. And, and Stanislav Grof was studying... Um, what he calls the perinatal matrices, which has to do with birth trauma, essentially. Like we're floating in this like nebulous watery womb where everything's safe. And then all of a sudden there's contractions, right? And that stimulates in my language, you know, past life trauma, but also just, it's a really um, unfortunate imprint on a newly forming psyche. Um, So during this time, they were, they were, hit with some problems because psychedelics are pretty taboo and astrology is horrendously taboo, right? So they knew that they were onto something with these patterns, but Richard Tarnas knew that he would need to establish credibility before writing about astrology. Um, So he actually started writing a book called The Passion of the Western Mind, which is this one right here. Um, And he spent 10 years writing it and it's, just an account of like the evolution of human thought through the lens of Western philosophy, that being kind of like the crucial component because so much of the world at this point is dominated by Western philosophy. Um, Like all of his writings, it's incredibly dense and somewhat hard to read, but it's really amazing. And what he was getting at there was this, um, several really paradoxical principles, which is what we'll talk about in just a minute. Um, But what they lead to is this kind of like disenchantment of the modern psyche, this idea that nothing's connected, um, everything kind of exists in and of itself, um, and that any attempts to ascribe meaning to the world or to one's experience is like a primitive reaction, and therefore it's not good. So he wrote that book, um, somewhere along the lines, he founded the philosophy, cosmology and consciousness program at California Institute of Integral Studies. The goal of that program being to address the paradigm shift that we're going through as a culture or the collective rite of passage that we're going through. Um, and bridge disciplines. So bridge philosophy, um, astrology, psychology, math, biology, and all of these things to try and re-enchant the cosmos, right? To try and deconstruct this notion that nothing is connected. Um, So where Cosmos and Psyche, the book that is about astrological alignments or planetary alignments, actually, because he he leaves the signs out of it, um, where that picks off where that picks up is with this idea that um, we as humans cyclically go through these like paradigm shifts or rites of passage, and they tend to be really, really intensely uncomfortable, destructive, and oftentimes violent periods. He compares the current one that we're going through to the switch from the earth centered universe to the sun centered universe. Right. And in that process, um, which I mean, that transition took, two or 300 years. And in that process, the people who were coming forward saying that was the case were, you know, burned at the stake or, you know, at best they were ridiculed and outcast from society. Right. Because so much of the foundations of thought at that point were based on the, on the notion that the earth was the center. So it threw everything off. Um, And so we are going through a similar paradigm shift at this point in time that is similarly tumultuous, although I would say probably more so because we actually have the technologies to wipe ourselves out at this point, uh, which makes the apocalyptic contents of it a little bit more concrete. Um, 
but the gist of it is that our culture is, um, we have two, we have two prominent paradigms or predominant paradigms, right? Um, and one of them is the myth of progress, right? And so that's this kind of like, <clears throat> uh, the journey of like human evolution has been this epic narrative of progress where there's this like long heroic journey from dark ignorance in, in the primitive world and suffering and discomfort and limitation into the brighter modern world of knowledge and freedom and free will and well being. Um, and you know, in a lot of ways, this country was founded on that. That's kind of like manifest destiny encapsulated. And so that trajectory of human progress there is sustained by the development of reason, um, the emergence of the modern mind and modern consciousness. Uh, and so there's kind of this like onward and upward thrust in that paradigm. So it's usually like the masculine hero that's like rising above the constraints of nature and the apex of achievement has to do with science and democracy and individualism. Right. And so that paradigm is kind of so close to us that it's become common sense, right? It's, it's filtered into all of our institutions and our ways of knowing. The second myth is the myth of the fall, right? So regardless of whether or not you're, you know, practicing Christian, the myth of the fall is inherent in our society as well. And so that's the idea that um, human history, the evolution of human consciousness is, is problematic, um, it's tragic and there's this kind of like progression of humanity's, um, progression of humanity as being a, a gradual but radical fall from grace, whatever grace means in that context, right? So there's separation from the state of oneness. There's like the romanticism of primitive nature when we were all, you know, dancing on the earth as connect, collective, connected tribes. Um, and it's just that kind of like, in the in the primitive or primordial connect uh, condition, humans had um, they had instincts, right? They were connected to intuition. They were connected to cycles, um, and so now we're at this kind of midnight point, right? Rather than being this like onward and upward progression, right now we're at a midnight point where there's like ecological crisis and threat of nuclear annihilation and all of those things. So you can see how kind of like those two lenses are, they both inform our situation, right? Like I can see myself identifying with both of them. Um, and so they kind of like inform and implicate each other and just kind of like weave into this really complex tapestry um, that has to be examined because it's our lens, right? And so it's kind of like, it's difficult to, remain open to awareness of both of them without like suppressing things, kind of like be in the paradox of both of them. Um, but I think that part of his work is saying like, that's what we have to do. All right. So before I keep babbling, any questions or comments or anything? So no, no questions so far. I, I appreciate the direction you're, you're going right now. So it's informative. Thank you. Okay. Um, so there's, I don't know how familiar you guys, you guys are with like Jungian stuff and the transcendent function, but it's the basic idea that when we're stuck in the tension of opposites, a third thing arises. And so the third, the third thing in Tarnas's work or the third, um, what's arisen from that tension is a, a third worldview or a third mythological lens that he would say is increasing in popularity, but is also far more insidious and far more um, covert, I guess, for lack of a better word. Um, and so this is the idea that there's no coherent pattern, right? There's no um, connection that exists outside of human interpretation. So like everything, anytime we're looking for meaning or we find connection, it's just a function of anthropomorphizing in extremes right? And so patterns are only projected, and because they're only projected, they don't mean anything. Um, and the, the pattern resides in the human subject or the human observer rather than the historical object, right? So it's all subjective. Um, and so therefore, history is a construct. 
and therefore, you know, science is everything. Or therefore, if you can't see it, it's not worth looking into. And this is kind of a, this is a product of the scientific revolution. Um, and that, you know, the, the, I, this is like, you know, Kant and um, Descartes essentially saying like, yes, two thirds of the human experience is consciousness and therefore subjective, but we need to subject everything to the scientific method. And if it can't be subjected to the scientific method, then it doesn't exist. We're not concerned with it because we can't concretize it. Right. And so in that process, two thirds of human experience, I mean, I'm using a random number here. Um, most of human experience doesn't count because it cannot be put into categories. Right. And it is just this kind of like nebulous thing that's floating. And so what we have now is kind of like a shadow of the enlightenment or the scientific revolution. Um, and it's like that, the, the skepticism that the scientific worldview encourages is important, right? Like we need to be discerning. Um, we need to critically evaluate the ideas and concepts that we come across. Um, but we also need to recognize that that's another lens. It's not something that is inherently true in and of itself. It's another lens. Um, and so it's interesting because this third world view recognizes that we do see things in interpretive categories and it, it recognizes that we do, we are trying to like make meaning out of things. Right. But it fails, it fails to apply that same understanding to itself. It fails to see that the scientific or rational worldview is another worldview. Okay. And so we have this kind of like, um, ultimate cosmological disenchantment, right? Because like, if nothing means anything, then nothing means anything. And the thing about the, you know, what, what goes back to the initial quote that I was reading is that that is a, a process of anthropomorphization in itself. Like there's, there's a hubristic inflation that happens there, right? It's just kind of like reverse of how we normally think of it. Um, and so it's, what Tarnas would say is that that is the absolute privileging of the human. That's the ultimate act of anthropocentric projection, but it's very subtle. Um, and it's like, let's see here. I have something written down. Um, perhaps the modern mind has been projecting soullessness and mindlessness on a cosmic scale systematically filtering and eliciting all data according to its self-evaluating assumptions at the very moment we believed we were cleansing our minds of distortions. Have we been living in a self-produced bubble of cosmic isolation? Perhaps the very attempt to de-anthropomorphize reality in such an absolute and simplistic manner is itself a supremely anthropocentric act. And so Agreed. Go ahead. I just say I agree. That yeah. was one of my my observations. So it's, I mean, when I I came across Cosmos and Psyche ten or eleven years ago, when I was just I had just finished a bachelor's degree in social sciences, and like I knew that I was really into Foucault, and I knew that I was really interested in the evolution of human thought, and that I wanted to like do something further education around that. But I was kind of in this, you know, nebulous, empty space in my life. And I came across Cosmos and Psyche and remembered an early life love of astrology and recognized that not only was he addressing these like par these paradigms, but astrology in a way that helps us to understand collective and social movements. And I was like, oh, this, this is the key. And then it's just been a really long, strange trip since then. Okay, questions, comments? I have a whole I have a whole page load, but I don't want to I, I don't want to take over the discussion, so I'm waiting for Marco to Voices, opinions. 
or Ed or John or John. I had an experience. I, I will chime in a little bit. Uh, a personal sort of dilemma, as you were mentioning, Amanda, some of us are in the in the middle of these different paradigm shifts uh, and different kinds of phenomena can emerge and they take us by surprise. Uh, some of this would be called paranormal. And, um, you know, a lot of this is uninvited, but some of it is may have been invited. Uh, but when it actually appeared, we wanted to go back to where it came from. <laughs> and I think this is the challenge. And I think uh, it's in a, in, a, in a pop culture and our movies and in a, a lot of our, our sci-fi. Um, but I had an experience, I, I, I think it was in my middle 20s, and there was lots of weird things happening in my life. But I had, um, I was, I'd always been drawn to the tarot, and I had a, I had a pack of tarot cards in, a, in, in silk, and I would bring it out, and I would do readings for my friends in a very intuitive way. And um, I did really very little study of, of the cards other than just, you know, I, I had a background in reading Jung, so I did, was familiar with the archetypes. But basically, it was just a, a session where I would pick up on vibrations from the person, and I would look at the card and the, the patterns that were emerging in the interplay of all these cards. And um, I would just make some guesses about their life circumstances. And um, something would often register very strongly, but it was very affective. Uh, it wasn't um, coming from a cerebral kind of, but anyway, I had a direct experience. I went to bed one night, I got up in the middle of the night and I had, um, I, was, I was sitting on the edge of my bed and I was just using the high priestess, the major arcana, there's a figure of the high priestess. And um, I was just sort of contemplating that image. And I had a, a, like a bolt of lightning very kundalini kind of experience. It went up my spine. I felt a sense of uh, expanding upwards and um, ending up in a landscape that uh, was very unfamiliar to me. And there was a figure there. And uh, it was a figure in black, you know, sort of classic uh, Ingmar Bergman death figure. And it told me to go back to where I came from. And I did, and I ended up in my bed um, and very, very startled, to say the least. <laughs> and I really didn't want that to happen again. I think I put away the tarot cards until about a month ago. And I went out and I, I bought a new one, I bought a new pack. And <clears throat> I'm starting to explore it again. Um, but in this case, sometimes, uh, sometimes things come to us that we, we, we were open to, as I was in this uh, experience with the Tarot, certainly in a very intuitive way, because um, I had no formal training in any of it. But it, I actually entered into something, another dimension, whatever you want to call it. But whatever I entered into, the entity that was in that other area of our psyche, perhaps, told me to go back. So I had interfered. And this has happened to me many, many times, uh, unintentionally entering into these zones where I don't actually belong. And uh, some sort of threshold figure says, uh, how did you get here? And uh, maybe you should go back. Um, but some, on a few occasions, I've been invited to stay. So I have these experiences and these are really anomalous and they don't fit in any of the sort of current um, rational, mental structured kind of psychology, which we're, we're all familiar with in school and in most therapy. Um, but I think these are the kind of experiences that I've had that make, um, make for tremendous uh, cognitive dissonance, but also it's an attractor. Um, because I want, I have this uh, sleuth in me, this detective, who is looking for, is constantly searching for evidence, and um, I want to, I want to put together a compelling um, sort of case um, for how do we integrate these 
these kinds of odd anomalous experiences besides just pretending they didn't happen or go out and, you know, do something that the culture encourages, like take some Prozac or do something, uh, take some antidepressants and pop a pill and go shopping, you know, just forget about it. So, Mark, is that what you uh, agree with a hundred percent there? Or? Are you asking me if I agree well, with you're something? You're the only Mark that I know here. So, if I go, is that what you meant, Mark? I guess it's you. <laughs> well, there's Marco. Uh, it's not Mark. <laughs> I, don't, I, I don't. I don't agree with anything one hundred percent. I'm. O I'm always open to being, you know, wrong. Uh, so, be more specific. With, well, is that after what Amanda had, had gone through what she had said, you said, well, you, would, you agreed with that very much. And John's response didn't seem to be precisely that which I thought I heard Amanda say and I heard you agree with. I'm, I'm a little confused on, 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 on where it is we are right at the moment. This, this, this whole idea that, that humans... I might have misunderstood something, though, so correct me if I'm wrong, but I get this idea that like, there is a lot of human projection on, on things. And we, and we do just project a lot of meaning into things that, where there is no meaning. But uh, um, how do we know that that's what we're doing? Well, that's the part that's, that we don't know in, the, in that. But you see, you see evidence like I was, I was heartened, if that's correct word, when Amanda mm -hmm. said that uh, the guy, the guy in um, uh, uh, Richard, Richard recognized that he was projecting his uh, perspective onto the universe while at the same time saying, that's what we do. And we have to stop doing that because the universe is this, but he recognized that he was projecting. Mm -hmm. So I, I was, I was heightened. I was heartened by mm -hmm. that. And, and also John's mm -hmm. personal description that happens. I, I, if you're some, if you somewhat pay attention to what's going on, those sorts of things happen, and I think if you're of of a uh, certain intellect or personality, you question that and want to, answers. That's pretty human that we want answers. So I agree with pretty much everything that's been said, but I'm not going to say hundred uh, percent. I wasn't looking for hundred percent. I can kind of jump in there and riff off a couple things. Um, one is that, that, that the idea of projection, I don't, I think that what's being said in this work. So archetypal cosmology is a framework that now has like, there's a book called archetypal cosmology. These are all people who have studied with Richard Tarnas. And what it's saying is that, yes, we do project and it is not a bad thing to project as long as you're aware that's what you're doing. In fact, if you're aware that you're projecting, then you can learn a whole bunch from it. And that's the really like reclaiming projections is the important piece because it's saying like, you know, in like really simplistic psychological speak, if like I'm walking into a room all the time and I'm saying like, Oh my God, these people are all so judgy. I probably can't change them, but I can say, okay, where am I judgy? Like, where am I judging myself? How is that principle of judgment coming into me? And that's how the collective change is right. Is, so Jung would say that it's our highest moral obligation to reclaim our projections so that everybody can be who they're, they're, they actually are. But it's also a Herculean task. Like, it's almost impossible at times. And so when it comes to projecting onto heavenly bodies, it is again, that awareness that like this planet we call Neptune is not inherently like trying to create delusion and fog in my brain, but for whatever reason, and Tarnas would say it's through synchronicity. There are things that happen 
that just connect us to meaning, right? And then we can say like, oh, well, that doesn't actually mean anything because I'm just projecting. Or we can say, I'm definitely projecting something here. And that doesn't mean that it exists in and of itself, but it's somehow relevant for me, right? So like the other day I had an experience where I, I, was, writing a, I was writing a column about the Virgo new moon and I kept seeing this image pop into my head and it's a fairly like popular painting. It's of like a priestess woman holding a bowl of water. And I don't normally, I'm not, I don't see things usually. I'm, I perceive through feeling and, and knowing. Um, but this image was just like right in my mind's eye. And so I was like, okay, well, I'll look it up. And I was trying to like search because I figured it was relevant to what I was writing. So I'm like trying to Google search like priestess with bowl, priestess with water. And it wasn't coming up, but I saw something about ISIS. And I was like, oh, I work with ISIS a lot. So maybe it's ISIS. And then I was looking at where the asteroid ISIS was in the astrological chart because I figured it would be prominent, but it wasn't. So I kept looking and I discovered that the painting was called Circe Individuosa. And so I started looking at where asteroid Circe was in my personal astrological chart and the chart of the new moon. And I discovered that the asteroid Circe is conjunct my sun, which means that like in a lot of ways, I am defined by the energy of what that archetype represents. And it was playing directly into the new moon. And the energy of Circe, although I haven't researched it a lot, is this kind of energy that comes up that's very witchy and manipulative and a little bit on the wrathful side. And that's exactly the kind of energy that I had been experiencing for like the two days leading up to the event. So like, I can't look for concrete truths about what that is or how it happened, but I know that I was searching for the relevance and a piece of information came into my mind or into my awareness that seemed relevant. And so now I have another mythological archetype that I can work with on an ongoing basis. And I just kind of like put the question of like the whys and hows to the side and simply say like, it is. That's, that's what happened and that's how it existed. Okay, that's, that's very helpful. That was exactly the link that I was, I, I was missing beforehand that, that kind of put that all together. Yeah. No, uh, there was some uh, research done at the uh, Gotteneum in, uh, that's the Steiner Institute in Switzerland, about, the, um, about metals and planets. And I think the woman's name was Kuzinko. I'd, I'd have to look it up. Mm. But this is, this is a... Um, scientifically a very clean indication that there are influ there is a relationship between metals and certain planets that it actually did so i i know we don't think that thomas ring doesn't doesn't say you know the, the planet tells you to do something or that it's you know connected in some way but there there does seem to be more than um there's a stronger connection than I, one might expect. Though right. I'm not clear on what kind of connection that might be. Right. Yeah. And so like in the, I think that in the modern paradigm, a lot of times what I, what I would hear people say, like what I would hear the staunch atheist, skeptic, nihilist in my life say is, that's just your belief. Belief doesn't mean anything. But what I would say is that like, if for thousands of years, humans have been projecting meaning onto this metal, right? It seems to have that meaning. Like it doesn't matter if I can't subject it to the scientific method. It does. It's just like when an eclipse happens, right? Those tend to be, you know, in ancient times, if an astrologer failed to predict an eclipse, the emperor would have them killed because they were for whatever reason associated with, you know, bad events in the real, in the, in the physical world. Right. And so like when I, when there's like a lunar eclipse at night and I look out at the moon turning blood red, I'm like, oh man, that, it evokes the sense of like, <laughs> in me, it feels spooky, right? And so over time we kind of, we project and then it starts to accumulate significance. Um, but what- I think that, not, not to interrupt, but it is a very, I think, um, important point in all of this um, I, I tend to, to think that it, our, our projections do have an influence on, on others. Um, I think one of the reasons, for example, Marilyn Monroe, 
um, left this life so early is that she was the subject of such massive projections that she and her own psyche couldn't couldn't hold up to that. And I think that uh, anybody that's ever been um, the head of an organization, or the head of um, even a small business where you have employees, you, you, you get an entirely different feeling about your life and how things work because of those who are around you who are are constantly putting their projections on you that you have to also deal with in addition to everything else. So I, there is something very, I think, concrete about it because it is, it is you know, we might not be able to measure it. In, we don't have a, a device that puts on all oh, your projection index is, is this right now. But, but it's something that I think, even though I, I say I subjectively feel it, I think it's objectively there in addition. Right. And that, like, I mean, collective collective figures are really interesting to look at because you look at, I mean, Hitler was the receptacle of shadow projections of millions of people. Donald Trump is the same thing, right? I mean, that doesn't um, give them space to get away from personal accountability, but it's much easier to use figures like that as scapegoats rather than reclaim the projections and say, okay, where am I a narcissistic mess? How am I inflated? Where am I seeing everything else as a self object? Right. Um, it's also tricky. Uh, we project, but there are counter projections. We are projected upon. I mean, as a gay person, I was very, very aware of this uh, at a very early age. Uh, that the, and the, it's very subtle and energetic. It is not verbalized um, until you know you're at a certain age you really do model the adults and teachers around you. Mm -hmm. uh, you have no alternative but to do that. And you learn all the language games that they're using and you, you know, integrate them. And then later you start to be able to get some kind of detachment from mm -hmm. those learning experiences and you can redo them. And I think at a very deep level, as you get older, hopefully you go more in that direction rather than in, just taking the lessons you learned when you were very young and try to reproduce them over and over and over again mm -hmm. and getting worse results. Um, and I think that's the challenge for us uh, as we start to move out of this uh, into, you know, this uh, deficient mental, um, which is very much about prediction and control and objectivity mm -hmm. and, um, uh, and failing to appreciate uh, those the subtle, uh, the very subtle energetics that make that uh, that view possible, uh, and the experimental is uh, is driven by uh, a lot of the same intentions that magic is driven. By. Sure. Um, they want results, certain kinds of results, and there are certain kinds of knowledge and different kinds of knowledge that we need to be paying attention to so that we uh, don't throw out the, the, the enormous um, learnings that we've accumulated through the mental structure. Uh, and that's, I think, our, our big challenge that we don't, um, and I think this is what I think Tarnas was talking about with the postmodern turn. Um, the postmodern has wanted to preserve uh, plurality rather than these uh, total, what is it, totalizing unities that the, the science, current scientific paradigm in its deficient phase seems to be promoting. And these totalizing unities tend to break apart eventually and crash and burn. And I think that science is actually catching up. I think that physics and quantum physics and all that are catching up to this more like nuanced view of reality. It just takes the collective a really long time to catch up with science. Right. And at this point, we're kind of in this pressure cooker because we need we need to reenchant the cosmos. We need to see that things are connected so that we stop using the earth as the sewer so that we stop, you know, <laughs> all these we stop doing all these cycles that we're participating in. Um, yeah. So I'm thinking about switching into talking about more concrete examples of archetypal cosmology. But before I do that, does anybody else have any tangents or questions? I want to point out that maybe we were, there were a couple of different um, 
uh, axes uh, of <clears throat> differentiation that we were talking about here, the, because one had to do with, I think, the nature of reality, like whether reality includes subjectivity or is only objective and subjectivity is a epiphenomena, right? And that's more of the you know, scientific view. But then there was something more about, I should say scientific view, not exactly scientific, but then there was something more just about the meaning of experiences and how, uh, you know, whether or not there's validity uh, or um, reality to weird experiences that uh, don't correspond, don't match up with a, a, an object, objective or materialistic kind of view of the world. So, in other words, one part of it has to do with ontology, and the other part has to do with epistemology. Like, what is actually real? And then, what is real about how we actually know what's real? I, I hope that doesn't, that's not too confusing, but it was, um, like, John, John's examples were a little bit, I think, different than, than the points you were making about, like, worldview. You know, like th those were really about meanings of personal experiences and the other had to do with what we regard as objectively real in the, in the universe around us. Does that make sense? My internet connection died in the middle of that, unfortunately. So no. <laughs> that's weird because the last time I spoke up, you just disappeared. And yeah, so, that's weird. <laughs> maybe I should just keep quiet. <laughs> Can, can you able to restate what you said? I'm sorry. Um, I felt like there were two different conversations going on or like two different layers of, of conversation. And I was trying to articulate what, what those were just because I thought they might be relevant to how the discussion kind of unfolds. Um, and, and like I, maybe one is that this, I, there's a kind of idea that Richard Tarnas is presenting that, the universe, the cosmos is and sold. That's mm -hmm. the nature of it. And that in a materialistic, scientific paradigm, it's not seen that way. It's regarded as a mechanical, you know, just energy that um, somehow evolves into living forms and intelligent beings who then have all these ideas about what is real. And they project that <clears throat> back onto that isn't just material reality. Mm -hmm. And so that's one way of looking at reality. The other conversation had more to do with our personal experiences yeah. and how we make meaning out of them. That's what mm -hmm. I was, and, and of course they're linked. Mm -hmm. Go ahead, John. Yeah. You're not I, dis I disagree. Okay. I'm not okay. talking of my personal experience is not just my personal experience. Okay. And I, can, I think I, there's I, a, I don't want to interrupt you, John, but um, I, I guess I am, but <laughs> it's just a brief statement that maybe will clarify, but it's from one of the books where we're studying, um, and the author states that science itself isn't a form of occultism that is presenting the world of matter and form as giving us something that that is... Like, like we we don't know anything about the microscopic particles until we actually deep dive into it. And you touched on that, Amanda, at the beginning, where the world view from or the shift from Earth center to the world revolving around the sun was was a crazy idea, and people were killed because of that. And people aren't being killed per se for ideas now. Um, so the scientific worldview is still in force and still discovering and deep diving into the quantum. So a personal account maybe is, is also the uncovering, but the issue is that it's, it's solely the individual perspective and maybe little dots here and there of other people that experience this, but there's no visual, tangible five cents evidence of any of this but sorry i interrupted john i just wanted to add that well i think we're all clarity, trying to maybe. articulate this as best we can and it's um we can always go back and revise and there may be distortions 
generalizations that we uh, later come to reject, and that's fine. Um, but I found myself um, articulating something that I don't think was just personal. Um, I think there's there's pre-personal, personal, and I believe in a transpersonal. And I think there's an interplay. And I think this happens in everyday life. Every time we come up with a sentence and we're trying to communicate to another person who speaks the same language that we do, they have to figure out what we're talking about. And I have to figure out if they figured out what I'm talking about, <laughs> that will shape further communications. And I'm usually drawing upon the non-physical, the tone of the voice, the breathing pattern, all kinds of uh, affective, what I call the affective. Um, and I think our intellect rides upon those kinds of exchanges. So I'm not talking about just something purely subjective that can be ob turned into an object. Um, I think we're in this intersubjective zone. And I think, I think you got it right, Amanda, when you, when you said that some, of the, some um, scientists are getting this, how complex the, the acquiring scientific knowledge is. The daily lives of most scientists are just working with problems that they want to get solved. They don't necessarily know what science is. But I think there are some scientists who are becoming philosophers as well as scientists. And I think this uh, uh, is the challenge, is how do we create philosophy um, that is relevant to some of these, to the, the exposing the cracks in the, in the foundations of this deficient mode. And so I, I think we're in the same conversation, um, Marco. I don't think this is just me uh, going into uh, first person from nowhere. I think I'm talking about something that could cohere in a we space. And I believe that's very important that persons who have anomalous experiences get clear about what those are and try to share them in an articulate way using the language that we already have but perhaps we're going to need create new kinds of language games that uh, can accommodate these kinds of differences. Mm -hmm. So I'm not into splitting epistemology from ontology from axiology. I think our values, our ways of knowing, and our first person experiences are all valid. And we just have to find ways of bridging the gaps. And I think creating bridges is another thing that I think Amanda brought forward from Tarnas's work between the different disciplines within science, um, there are huge gaps. And there are, and I think science is starting to figure out new models for how are we going to bridge those gaps between the micro and the macro without contaminating uh, the macro with our micro assumptions, which we've not explored particularly well. Mm -hmm. This gets very amplified, I think, in our politics as well. Um, so, and in all walks of life. Hmm. So I'm just putting that out there that I'm not just talking about my, my personal story here. There was an intention to open up uh, an area that we often suppress and reject. Hmm. And I wish other people would come forward more often and um, offer their anomalies because it takes a certain amount of courage to do that since we're penalized at a very young, very young age for doing so. Hmm. I think I, I, this this might tie into what Marco was saying. I'm not sure, but something that I just want to point out is that, like, I agree with the heart of what you're saying, John, very much so. Um, but something that I noticed when you were talking just now and when you were talking about your personal experience that I think is relevant is that I hear, um, I hear that need coming through to know, like, to know the truth of what it is that is happening in those experiences. And that to me is another example of the kind of like scientific paradigm, right? Which has in, in some ways become very fundamentalist in and of its own, it, in and of its own. Um, and that kind of like science is actually a very fluid thing, but people will be like, look, science has proven this thing to be true and therefore it is true. And then like 20 years later, science proves that it was wrong 
right? So there's a fluidity even to the concrete scientific experience. And so like when I heard you talking about your experience with that figure, you ascribed to it a very, a, a kind of linear construct, like you had gone somewhere you weren't supposed to go and they were sending you back. Whereas when I heard it, that's not what I thought at all. I thought it all depends on everything. Like it could be that, you know, it was one of your guides saying like, you're not grounded or prepared to travel the astral realms right now, but like, come back, try again later. Um, <laughs> and so like your interpretation of it is based still on that like linear trajectory of I'm trying to get to the concrete truth. And I think that part of the, you know, insanity of living in these times is that there isn't a way to know concrete truth. There's a way to know our relationship to what's happening. Um, but it is all very subjective and part of the, the issue with, I think like what we would call masculine rational paradigm is it's oriented towards trying to know the capital T truth. Well, I think it's intersubjective as you have uh, an interpretation of an experience that I reported from 30, 40 years ago. And I have different feelings about that experience and you have different experience, uh, feelings about or, or view, or view of my subjective report. So I think we're in the, in the field of the intersubjective. Yeah. And we could tell lots of different kinds of stories, mm -hmm. um, but there would be, I think, uh, aspects of, the, of it that's intersubjective. And we can pay attention to that. And I think when we do, we start getting um, better results than just projecting onto someone else and glomming onto them with our theories about them or vice versa. And then just having spats about projection and counter projection, which right. I think which what's most psychoanalysis ends up doing. Right. I, I believe we are starting to liberate ourselves from those kinds of um, as you were as you were describing, those kinds of linear kind of narratives we've all been trained in. Well, that are based in like concrete, tangible reality. And that kind of that ties back into the the bigger picture with our typical cosmology in that um one of the things that it's saying is that astrology as a predictive art, like predicting concrete versions of the future is bullshit, right? Like that seemed to work thousands of years ago when there was like a lot less options for everything. And you could look at a chart and be like, oh, this person probably won't get married. Nowadays, not only is that really like, and there's still astrologers who will do things that way. But nowadays, not only is that not really like right a lot of the time, but it can be harmful because it takes people's power away. It helps them to externalize their power. And so what astrology is good at doing or our typical cosmology at the collective level is predicting spiritual, emotional, and social trends for the collective because we can look back throughout history to see when the same alignments were going on and what was happening then. It's not as good at predicting concrete reality, although it can do that too. Um, but before I travel down that rabbit hole, circling back to Marco, <laughs> where are you at with your initial question? <laughs> well, I, I, I definitely didn't want to create a bifurcation between ontology and epistemology. So I appreciate that there's a bridging that needs to happen and is already intrinsic between those two um, kind of modes of philosophy and also between this subjective, personal, intersubjective, collective, and the ob objective um, uh, or, inter you know, the, the, the real for, for lack of a better word. Um, I think that having a sense of objectivity is still important. Like it's still that, that even though we have personal and, and interpersonal experiences and can ascribe, tell stories about them, an infinity of mm -hmm. stories, basically, no end to the possibilities of the, the images, the sounds, the meanings, etc. cetera, that, that can be made. But there is... Um, I think an objective reality in which all that arises. And so having a, an attunement to that, as well as to the reality of the inter and intra um, subjective realities, I think is part of 
this paradigm, this kind of paradigm shift. It's, I think, what you know is meant by integral, meaning having those multiple dimensions, those multiple um, access planes, like planes of access to, to what's well, real. Well, holding the paradoxes. Yeah, yeah, um, because there's correspondences between them, but they also have their own unique kind of rules. Like, mm-hmm. you know, physics works for things. Um, and we can communicate with uh, concretely with uh, machines that are on Mars, right? That takes an incredible um, knowledge of how physical reality works. And so that, and that's not independent of the human and the consciousness based aspects. Uh, they're interrelated. And so I'm totally on board with that, like ontology. I, I think that, you know, there are many in our pluralistic global society, there are many different um, cultural pockets, right? Where, it's just taken for granted that reality is subjective or it's taken for granted that reality is objective. And there's like a multiplicity just even of worldviews. But I think once you commit to a certain understanding or not even commit to it, like once you um, attune with or align with a certain understanding, it almost doesn't make sense like to see it the other way. Um, Like in the sense that uh, it'll be hard to, for me to feel that life, like that reality is not alive, fundamentally alive, that it is dead, it just doesn't make any sense whatsoever. So it's almost just a, not, a no-brainer to to choose the you know the, the paradigm that that affirms the living re- intelligence of 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 the universe. I mean that it's like nonsensical. Like why would we not um, affirm that? Is I think. You know, so so I I feel that my I would like to get to the point where um, it's more or less taken for granted that we live in a living cosmos, and on that basis, what then becomes possible? Because if we're you know struggling with between materialists and you know psy, uh, pan psy, psychists, or it seems that there's less that can come out of that struggle at this point, like that that we need to step forward into, into the, um, the reality, which is obvious, and start to build from there what this new you know, next world wants to become. Um, that's, that's like a, I think, my, my feelings about it. So. And they're personal and interpersonal, maybe. <laughs> well, when you, see, when you see the world as inherently connected or ensouled, it changes the value system, right? There's a, there's a shift that happens when you are aware that actions have reactions. It it just shifts the values, right? I mean, that's, that's what I always think of is like, if we, if we live in a world that is not connected, then we can do anything we want to the earth, to the universe, to each other, because it doesn't matter because there's no meaning. Yeah. Yeah. I think that gets to the two suitors parable. Okay. So a piece of this archetypal cosmology stuff, as I've talked about a little bit, does have to do with astrology and that's where it is. Um, That's where do I want to go with this? We talk about the the reflective dynamics and the um, synchronistic dynamics. Where Tarnas starts in Cosmos and Psyche is with the idea that as as planetary archetypes have been discovered, um, we can see the correspondence in social and collective movements. Okay, so a little bit of a you know astrology lesson. There are seven personal planets. Two of them are luminaries: Sun and Moon and then Mercury out to Jupiter and Saturn. Um, Those are the planets that have been used for thousands of years for astrology, okay? And they usually refer to personal or interpersonal dynamics. The newbies, Uranus, Neptune, and Pluto, we'll get to Pluto's placement as a planet shortly, um, 
are what we call the transpersonal planets, okay? And so they were the first planets discovered since antiquity, starting with Uranus in 1747 or whatever it was. Um, and so the idea is that those archetypal, those archetypes kind of participated with the social dynamics that were going on when they were discovered. So um, Uranus, which is the planet of liberation and individuation and technological revolution and scientific revolution, was discovered during the technological revolution, the agricultural revolution, um, the French revolution, right? So it's an archetype of rebellion, essentially, against the status quo. It's an archetype that's trying to help us break free from our conditioning so that we can come up with more sustainable structures, essentially. Neptune was discovered mid-1800s, planet of a spiritual transcendence on the one hand, ecstasy, bliss, but also confusion, fogginess, um, altered states. And it was discovered during the time when, like, the spiritualist movement was coming to the forefront. Um, homeopathy was making another or its first in this culture kind of, like, rise, okay? So it's, like, holistic healing, alternative healing, um, things like that. Pluto, which is probably the most interesting one to me, because I wrote my freaking thesis on it, um, was discovered in 1930, 1932. Um, and Pluto, and, and these most of these do have correlates to the mythologies that they're named after, right? Like that's not necessarily why they were chosen. The The choosing part of what they were named seems to be fairly like, ambiguous. Um, there's some order there, but Pluto is the archetype that represents the eruption of the contents of the unconscious or the underworld up onto the surface. And so it's the really darkly transformative powers. Um, it is the deepest contents of the soul and the psyche. It is total transformation. It's death, chaos, sex, the occult, anything that brings us into contact with our limitations and then forces us or gives us the option to move through it with the idea that there's, you know, wealth and regeneration that come from that process. So when Pluto was discovered, we see the first um, detonation of the nuclear bomb. And so the image of the mushroom cloud becomes like a literal metaphor for what Pluto represents as an archetypal complex. We see the rise of fascism, World War II, Holocaust. Um, we see the rise of depth psychology, and Freudian psychology is coming in more into the mainstream, um, the mafia and the mob. So that's kind of like the, the criminal underground coming to the surface. And so you can see just by what was going on, historically speaking, when these planets were um, discovered, that those are, it's like those archetypal complexes were being constellated in the collective. All right. So... We can take, let's see, how do I explain this? The planets interact through mathematical alignments and angles in the sky, okay? And so that's just the idea that if we put, we put the, the sphere of the stars onto a two-dimensional piece of paper, um, those planets come into major alignment. So they'll make like a 90-degree angle with each other or they'll, or they'll make an opposition. They'll be opposite each other in the sky, which is really just on a, 2D piece of paper. So what Tarnas noticed is that when those big planets or those, those outer planets, sorry, and when I say big, I mean they're the ones that move the most slowly. So like the moon moves through the whole zodiac or around the earth in 28 days. Pluto's orbit is about 200 and I want to say 22 years. That's probably, I don't do well with numbers in case you haven't noticed. Um, so there, so it takes some of them a lot longer than others to travel around. So Uranus, Neptune, and Pluto move very slowly. Um, when they come into quadrature alignments with each other, so they're in the same zone of the sky, they are squaring each other in the sky, or they're opposite each other in the sky, we can see the dynamics of those archetypal complexes at play in the culture at large. Okay, so that's where we can go back through history and just plot out, okay, when, were, when was every time that Uranus and Pluto were in this dynamic alignment with each other over history, what was happening then? Um, so relevant to today, 
for an example, we're coming through a period of time, 2011 to 2015-ish, that was defined by a hard aspect between Uranus and Pluto. Uranus, which we can think of as like the Lord of lightning bolts, but more again, it's like liberation, sudden upheaval, um, shake up of the status quo, rebellion, liberation, technological revolution, was fighting with the Lord of the underworld, Pluto. Okay, so Pluto in this sense can represent like the powers that be, the powers that are trying to keep control. Pluto is definitely a control mechanism. Um, it is the unconscious. It's also tied in deeply to, um, earth changes, earthquakes, volcanic eruptions. So when these two planets, when they clicked into direct quadrature alignment, meaning they were at a 90 degree angle from each other in the sky was March 11th, 2011. And on that day, we get a perfect visual metaphor for what they represent a tsunami hitting a nuclear power plant. That's, that's Marco's birthday. <laughs> oh, lovely. Um, just, just saying. Yeah. So you see there this visual metaphor for what the planetary alignments or what the planetary archetypes represent, right? Pluto, tsunami, massive power of the Earth hitting technology, Uranus, and the breakdown that ensues. Now, during that time period, 2011 to 2015, we also see the Occupy movement coming to the forefront. Um, increased focus on civil rights. Um, and these all echo back to when those two planets were together in the sky. And the last time that happened was 65 to 69. Right? So we see similar themes then. Um, you know, historically speaking, there was a lot going on during that time, right? But it is that same feeling of like rebellion, rebellion against the status quo and trying to break down the social structures that aren't working. And then like the backlash against that from establishment powers, right? So there was a seed that was planted in the 60s when those two planets were in conjunction that now, or 2011 to 2015, were at a crisis or a readjustment point. Okay, so this is all cyclical. So what we can see then, I mean, if we're looking at it like coming down the pike, we can be like, these are the themes that we can expect, right? Based on the archetypes themselves, but also just looking back at similar trends in history when they've been in those same alignments. What we also know is that during those periods in particular, Uranus and Pluto alignments, there tends to be such upheaval in the collective that it takes a while for integration to happen, right? There's so much shaking and churning and all of that, that even after the alignment is, is less active or is moving out of um, direct alignment, that's when everybody starts to go, whoa, what just happened? The other thing that's really relevant right now is that... Um, Saturn, which is the planet of like structures, boundaries, limitation, laws, infrastructure, institutions, social conditioning, repression and denial, um, is coming into a conjunction with Pluto uh, in 2020. All right. So again, Pluto is the forces of the underworld and control mechanisms and all of that. What we know is that when the last two cycles so that let's see i have this written down here um 1913 to 16 was when pluto and saturn were conjunct and that's when we saw the eruption of world war one right it's kind of like a rapid escalation of these dynamics and then the war breaks out the first square or adjustment period of that was in 21 to 23. And so we see the like more decisive emergence of fascism and totalitarian regimes and Stalin um, seizing control of the communist party and Mussolini coming into power. Right. And so these are all reflective of the Saturn Pluto complex. Um, that's also when Hitler begins to rise. 
And so you can just kind of track these in terms of like warfare in our country. Another thing that we see with these alignments is, um, I mean, the next one, the next conjunction was in 46 to 48. And so that was when the Cold War started, right? The establishment of the Iron Curtain. Um, we see a connection between wall building, right? So the last time Saturn was where it is right now, or two cycles ago, was when the Berlin Wall went up. And then one cycle ago was when the Berlin Wall came down. All right, so we see how there is this reflective dynamic going on. And so there is this feeling, at least in the astrological community, that big stuff will likely go down in 2020, <laughs> right? Because we can see historically speaking that whenever those two forces come together, the reflection is of contraction, constriction, um, more conservative powers coming to the forefront and things like that. Uh, are you tracking it? How's this going? This is... <clears throat> This is great, Amanda. I have a, a question that's arising for me. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I don't know if this is a useful question for, for you or for the group, but um, I'm remembering a, a professor, a student, who was he? Karl Popper, he was a philosopher of science, he said the difference between magic and science is that science, theoretical science, can be falsified, uh, and magic cannot. And I, I think that's a very provocative question that has been challenged by many scientists. Some, some scientists are saying that scientific theories are not about falsification. But I'm just wondering about, since we've been musing upon subjective, intersubjective, objective, and what those can possibly mean, um, in this practice, how much of it is... And I think it's fascinating about Pluto and Saturn and the new planets uh, being discovered as Hitler and other kinds of, and some of the occult sciences were starting to emerge on the, in, in an interesting way. I think a lot of Freud came out of his uh, fear of the occult. So, and, and looking at these patterns and, and warfare and um, these possible connections, just how much of it is objective? How much of it is intersubjective? Uh, if you're working with a client and you're reading their, giving a reading or interpretate, or interpreting their horoscope, uh, I'm just wondering how that all falls out for you and how you make those kind of subtle determinations. That's a big question. I apologize. Yeah, for I'm, not, I'm not sure I'm totally tracking the question. But in terms of what we've been talking about, what I'll say is that it's all about context and lens, right? So like I can see how the Uranus Pluto square or the Saturn Pluto conjunction is playing out on the world stage. I can then locate it in an individual's chart and say like, Hey, let's first I'll just ask like, what is your relationship to what's going on in the world today? Right. Cause they'll say anything from like, man, I don't know what you're talking about to, Oh my God, I'm up with anxiety every night and I feel like I have a role to play, but I don't know what to do. Right. So then I'm talking about the macrocosm and then saying, you know, here's how it might be specific to you and here's how it might be relevant to you. And let's talk about tools that you have for working with it. Right. Because again, we can't really like shift the collective, but we can recognize the themes that are playing out there and make them relevant to our own lives and change. So that's I don't know right. if your questions, but... That's kind of, the, that's kind of a, a constructing a theory for this particular person you're working with. Mm -hmm. And the contact and the context in the lens is a, a product of a certain theoretical orientation as well. Mm -hmm. um, thank you. That's very helpful. Mm -hmm. And I mean, the other thing I do is when I start a lecture or a client section is I, I usually say, like, flat out, these are my personal bias biases and this is the lens I'm coming from. So take what works for you and leave the rest. And you're, you're, you're bridging the gaps between the micro mm -hmm. and the macro mm -hmm. and, and those different scales. So I think they're doing that in a lot of sciences 
is focusing on that, giving a lot of attention to that as well. But I think it's a different kind of knowledge that's yeah. being framed here. There's also this idea in poetic theory called the objective correl correlative. Heather Fester int introduced me to this, but it's the idea that the images or the objects in a poem are in a way an ex exterior correlate, correlate to interior experience and that there is no native um, you know, language to the invisible realm, to the interior realm, but we find language for it in our environment and then can compose that into, into poetry. And it seems that like when you ask a client, what's your connection to this event that's going on in the world, the, you know, this president or this, uh, this disaster, whatever it is, it's giving a one, one function of that is that it's providing a language for the ineffable, right? It's, it's mm -hmm. so that you can work both with both actually simultaneously right. because there is that um, internal connection between our individual and intersubjective ways of experiencing and projecting meaning into events and then how the events themselves unfold because they are partly created by our projections and um, in, you know, intentions and, and subjectivity. Yeah. And just riffing on that a little bit, um, what comes to mind is that when I'm, we're talking about these kind of generational aspects, right? Like because those outer planets move so slowly, there were people born in the late sixties who were born with that conjunction of Pluto and Uranus in their chart, right? They contain the seeds of the sixties within them. So as there's this unfolding process of their life, I can kind of track when that's being activated. And that's particularly relevant for like, there's a generation born, uh, a little micro generation born 89 to 90, 92 ish who have Neptune, Uranus and Saturn all conjunct in their chart in Capricorn. And right now Saturn's coming through activating all of that. And so I have all of these, you know, younger folks showing up in my consulting room saying, I feel like I need to get my shit together right now because there's a lot of pressure for me to help change the world. And I'm like, yeah. And they're, 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 a lot of them are in dire straits right now because they're like, do I do the established thing? Do I follow my conditioning? This is a Saturn archetype coming in and like focus on my career and buying a house and all of that. But how do I do that in the context of the world right now? When I know that like, we don't know what's going to happen with the economic system or the environment or anything like that. And so they're, they're dealing with this like confluence of total existential uncertainty in a system that's telling them like, if you just follow the rules, you'll get to this end point. Um, and they're having to deal with this in their like mid to late twenties in very intense ways. And so then I'm able to kind of look back at what the generational signature is and hopefully help them navigate that in a little bit. while also being able to hold space for saying like, yeah, it's scary stuff. <laughs> so where shall we go from here? Let's go to past life regression. <laughs> Where does that, I, I, I'm, I, I'm just curious. I think I followed your, your whole uh, thought process and up to now, but looking at it, looking at your website and when you really get down to it with a client, uh, you get into past life regression. So at, at what point you, you were just talking about, a certain generation coming in, let's say 89, what does that make them? Right around their 20s? Their late, late 20s. Yeah, so they're, I don't know, young adult to adult, and they're coming in at what, how does that transition 
take place where you might start to look at that with them. Look at past lives? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, if that's okay with the group to go yeah, there. Yeah, okay with the group. I, 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 I have one. If, if you could just say in 25 words or less, which is obviously not what I mean, but <laughs> just a very short statement. Because one of the things that um, Richard talks about a lot in his book are transits. And I'm not 100, when, I agree with Mark, I'm never 100% clear on anything or sure about anything. But if you could just say just a little bit about what transits and how that functions before we, because I'm very interested in the past life thing as well, but that's kind of. T- They're all connected. Um, okay. So in astrology, you have a natal chart right? Which is the chart. It's a, it's a map of the sky when a person was born. Um, and so that stays the same. That's a static thing. Like you always have the same natal chart. Uh, transits refer to where the planets are right now in relationship to a natal chart or a chart of an event. Right. So it's taking the chart of some kind of event, whether it's a birth or a um, world event or whatever, and then mapping where the planets are right now around that. Or like I can take my natal chart and be like, oh, I wonder what was I wonder what the transits were when I was six years old and my dad died. Right. So it's just referring to that, like where the planets were on a given date that's different than the established one. So then you take the natal chart or the original chart and then map the planets of a given date around it to see how they were relating then or like what they were constellating or what they might've been constellating. Okay. But he seems to place a lot of, a lot of value on, on these transits and, 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 and why are they so significant then? I mean, what, what, what's the significance in the relationship? Yeah, transits are significant because they they tell you about the dynamics of what's going on and that's it's the way that you keep things living, right? It's the way that you understand the fluidity. So Richard Tarnas, you, you you have personal transits. So again, that's the interplay between like the natal chart and then where where the planets are now, for example. And then you have world transits. Okay. So that's more about like right now at this moment in time, you know, the the moon is in Libra and um, what else is going on right now? Jupiter is sextiling the sun. Those are world transits. And so that helps us understand our current moment. And when we understand our current moment, then we can navigate more consciously. That's fine. Thanks. We, 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 We can dive. Okay. Anything else? All right. Um, past lives. So the kind of astrology, and I, and I will try to tie this into the current topic. Um, the kind of astrology that I study is called evolutionary astrology, and it's making the assumption that the natal chart, so the map of the sky when a person was born is not only telling us about some of the traits of the person and the themes of the person's life, but it's telling us about their karmic dynamics and what their soul has been intending to work through and live through in multiple lifetimes. So it's taking the idea that, you know, many, a vast many of the world's spiritual traditions have, which is that we do return. There is eternal return. Like that mythology is even um, inherent in the Christian religion. It's just been kind of distorted and taken out in a lot of ways. Um, And the reason that it is, I think, particularly powerful for people who gravitate towards evolutionary astrology is because it is somewhat trauma focused. And so it's the idea that there are some traumas that survive the trauma of death. Okay. And so this is part of why the Tibetans put such a focus on dying consciously, uh, because if we die consciously and we have lessons in how to navigate the afterlife states, then our karma is not as heavy because it's the difference between kind of like transitioning into the afterlife consciousness kind of like separates out 
and then like looks down and says, okay, I'm dead now. And I know what to do, right? Like I know to follow the clear blue light. I know to go to this place. And there's a whole process that happens there. Most of us die quite unconsciously without any concept of how to navigate afterlife states, what the afterlife states might be. Um, and we die oftentimes in trauma. Um, so some people would say that like, oh, like dying in your sleep must be so great. But my work shows me that not necessarily because there's a lot of confusion that happens. And so the death happens, soul or spirit or consciousness, whatever you want to call it, transitions out of the body and doesn't know where it is, what's going on, and has scripts in its mind that are lingering from the life. So I always have to do it alone or, oh God, they're going to get me or, you know, I never have enough, whatever, whatever it might be. So they start kind of like running through what the Tibetans would call the bardo states. Those scripts, psychological complexes or traumas become the demons that chase them through those states. And then the soul jumps into the first cave to hide and that ends up being the next womb and they're born with those same scripts. So evolutionary astrology uses the chart as a way of understanding the scripts or the karmic patterns um, that the soul comes in with. And so it takes away the idea of the tabula rasa, like we're not a blank slate. No one's a blank slate. We all come in with stuff. We can break that down to the energetic levels too, which is essentially that trauma Trauma gets lodged in the different energy bodies, emotional, spiritual, mental, all of that. But I think I'm going to put that off to the side for now. Um, And so when I'm looking at a chart, I'm looking at Pluto, which in the chart represents the soul um, in short. And it's no coincidence that our culture has demoted Pluto, demoted the soul, right? There's a resonance there. Um, And Pluto helps me to understand what the soul has been living through, what the deepest compulsions are, what the deepest emotional and psychological wounds are. Um, And Pluto is a generational signature. So like I was saying earlier, it travels very slowly through the signs of the Zodiac, although its orbit is elliptical. So it spends like a really long time in Cancer and Leo. Those are the zones of the sky. Um, And a very short time, relatively speaking, in Scorpio and Sagittarius. Um, So those are like little generations, right? So like when I get a person who comes in to see me, the first thing I look at is what's going on Pluto in their chart. And that tells me kind of like what their generational associations are. And then I understand like what those generations are trying to work through. Okay. And so it is a good way to help understand what karmic patterns are. And if I take the karma out of that, it's just like the really deeply entrenched patterns that we go back to that are really hard to get to move because even if they're painful, we tend to just go back to them because they're comfortable and they're what we know. And it's really usually a long process to unravel and shift karma. So when somebody comes in to see me for an astrology session, I'm not focused on like, oh, this was your past life and this is what happened and yada, yada, yada. I usually will, if, if past life, like specific past life stories come up, it's usually in the, in the sense of like, I'm telling a, um, a true story with made up facts. And that's because stories get to the heart of an emotional complex and people relate to stories. And so I will say, you know, it's something like lifetimes where you have been enslaved in your relationships okay, we can look at history and say like, yeah, marriage has been enslavement for a lot of people for a very long time, right? So it's a resonant story. And then I'm using details of the chart to kind of fill in the details. So in an astrological session, my goal is to help use those stories in order to get to the heart of a, of a karmic complex um, without getting a person to start fixating on what their past lives were because this life's way more important, <laughs> And people can get compulsively addicted to like, well, in my past life, I was da 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 da. And I'm like, okay, it's helpful as a tool sometimes. Um, So then for people who are really struggling with complexes, fears, phobias, chronic, uh, chronic ailments that aren't budging with conventional therapy treatment or whatever, I'll be like, okay, let's do some regression work with the idea there being that we can go 
into the lifetime where the person sustained traumas and injuries that have impacted them enough that it carries forward um, and do healing around that in terms of like catharsis really. So emotional catharsis, physical catharsis, you know, get the attacker off, get the noose off the neck, um, <laughs> bring bar- back the parts that have disassociated. So it's, it's like shamanic soul retrieval, but in a more multidimensional sense. That's the nutshell version. And, and, and I, I, so to bring it full circle there, I find this work to be incredibly healing for a lot of reasons, but the one that's most relevant is that <laughs> the karmic perspective is, is, is um, fascinating, but it's also difficult because it can be compulsive on its own. But if we look at it in terms of like what history shows us people have gone through for thousands of years, there's a lot of people being born in states of PTSD, right? I would say most of us in some way or another, not because we've necessarily like were killed in a gas chamber in the Holocaust, but because people have been harming each other in a lot of ways for a long time. And so conscious awareness and clearing of that material helps a person to be more present and more able to actually engage their lives now in ways that are healthy um, so that we can move through. So it's kind of like a really intense rotor rooter effect to just get it over with so that we can move on. That was a deep sigh, Amanda. (sighs) Questions, comments. Part of the deep sigh is because in like an hour I have, I, part of my health issues is that I had a cancer scare last year and I have to, I'm having issues come up now. So I have to go in and get a screen in like two hours. Um, (laughs) um, But also, it's just, it's a, it's a, it's heavy material. Thank you very much. It's fascinating. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I'm just curious. Does anyone want to leap in? No? Ed? Okay. Um, I, d- I have, I have lots of questions and not any very good answers. Um, I guess, um, I guess I'm very perplexed about a first person, second person, and third person, and the interplay of these. Um, and uh, earlier, uh, Marco talked about there is a there is a objective reality, and he also said. We are living in a living cosmos. And the question I have, not necessarily for Marco, but for the group, is how objective is that last statement? We are living in a living cosmos. Um, and, I'm, and I'm wondering about stories and how subjective is a story that I or you or any of us might tell. Um, and, but could there be objective elements in our storytelling uh, so that it isn't just uh, reduced to some sort of uh, first person phenomenon? So I, I'm, what I've learned from this conversation, um, and I'm probably going to pick this apart and try to go into it more deeply, uh, is that the objective, I believe, is a special case of the interplay of the first person and the second person. So you and I, when we get together, we're we're dealing with an issue that's very important to both of us. We may employ different kinds of objectivity. 
you may go into a, a natal chart and uh, someone else might go into a different area of uh, investigation. And there may be multiple myths that we might be drawing upon. But we can, I think, if we're sensitive to the lenses that we're using, bring all of that knowledge and potential knowledge to our investigation, rather than rely upon subordinating an objective knowledge or having all other kinds of knowledge subordinated to that scientific objective knowledge. That there are other kinds of knowledges that we can pay exquisite attention to and bring to the table. So I'm hoping that we can move from a question like I was asking of the statement that was made earlier by Marco. Um, are we living in a living cosmos? How objective is that statement? Is it a little bit objective? Very objective, not objective at all. Um, <clears throat> because if enough of us share that, uh, then it's not necessarily just Marco's subjective opinion for the day. Uh, so I'm sort of looking at how we're going to bring together all of the, these different kinds of uh, systems of knowledge and bridge those gaps. I think it's a a, a huge effort that we're trying to make to even art articulate this kind of stuff. But as you were uh, exploring with us uh, the, your methodology, Amanda, I recall that uh, as a beginning Tarot student of Tarot, that um, I was, uh, I think, tapping into some something that was very real that was happening between me and the persons that I was sharing my interest in Tarot with. Um, but I don't know that how much of it could be objectively real. Maybe a little bit, maybe a lot, maybe not at all. And it's very fluid. And as we have multiple interpretations of the everyday events that happen in our lives, how much more complex are the, the things that are anomalous and that are not mundane at all? How do we go about um, finding a frame that, that, that can honor all of this complexity? So thank you. I think I'm gonna let somebody else jump in with that one because I need to get some water. So I'm gonna take you guys off video really quick. But if nobody else answers, I'll, I'll come up with something. So I missed a little section in there from the point that Amanda was discussing, I guess the 2020 catastrophes or bigness that could arise and then I zoned out, my connection zoned out, and then I jumped right into something I was very interested in with um, the Bardo states. So maybe somebody could fill me in on that gap here in a minute if, if it comes up, but uh, that's not necessary. But I got the main gist of it and kind of tying it in with the first part of the conversation, along with what you're saying, Johnny, it, it seems like we're always on this mission, whether we want to or not, want to be or not, to make the implicit explicit. And even even that which cannot be objectified, um, there's something in us that desires to have that interconnection with, with the interpersonal realm to make it the implicit explicit in some way, even if it's just a connecting bond. Um, so that's just a comment, perhaps a question I have, but I don't know what the question is there. Just filling in the gaps here. Somebody else can join in. <laughs> I don't have an answer, but I, I, what's coming to mind is that we've, um, in our, our Bindo discussions, uh, we've talked a little bit about this because we've talked about knowledge and Aurobindo's different kinds of knowledge, knowledge based in the mind, knowledge based in the supramental uh, consciousness, and also knowledge that's life knowledge or um, you know, knowledge is an exp for Aurobindo is an expression of a fundamental reality of consciousness, and it has different expressions at you know, different levels. 
Um, but there's a fellow in those talks, Fred, who has been making the argument or the point in a couple of different topics around the necess- the importance of having some objective uh, basis for knowledge claims. And um, even making the argument for the importance of, or at least su- suggesting books that, <clears throat> that make the argument for the importance of having an absolute um, to count to, to uh, provide sort of a complement to the relative multiplicity, uh, the subjective. Like that, that if we're to say that something is true or real, it can't just be because of personal opinion, nor even of interpersonal, even though we know that the personal and interpersonal shape what we regard to be objectively true. But still, even if that's the case, we need to, have to and this, this is, hit, I'm reconstructing a philosophical argument that Fred is making, so I may not do this perfectly, but I just want to presence it because it's in the wider space. But his point, as I t- understand it, is that we still have to have um, a pole uh, in our understanding of reality for the objective because it needs to be a kind of um, orienting uh, um, I don't know the, the language is tough on this, but an, a sort of orienting, orienting um, location around which we can organize our intersubjective discussions. Like if we're not talking about the same thing, if 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 we're completely talking about different things, and other groups with other intersubjective fields could be referring to something completely different, then there is nowhere to ground our um, our claims or our expressions. So you, you may read somebody's chart in a certain way, but then can somebody else come and say, not that you know, your whole mode of, of relating to knowledge is wrong, but can they question, well, maybe we can interpret this transit in this other way, and could they be relatively more right than an interpretation that you might have first given? And if they could be, then you know, what is that on the basis of? It has to be some objectivity that you can both recognize or others can recognize is a more ad, is a more valid and more adequate interpretation of the evidence that presents itself in this person's you know story, their emotions, whatever. Does that? I think that I'm trying to kind of maybe I don't have an answer, but it's it's meant to presence just the other a perspective that's come up. <laughs> yeah, I mean, discussions about like objective reality are not they're not my forte. Um, I choose to just opt out of them for the most part because they're maddening to me. Um, when it comes to astrology, it is not objective. Um, it can be objective in hindsight. <clears throat> like if somebody comes in and says, like, I think that this transit will look like this. And then another astrologer says, no, I think it will look like this. Like time will tell. Um, and so in that sense, it's good as like a teaching tool in some ways, like uh, studying astrology and like the past or astrology and like concrete personalities, like uh, public figures can bring some objectivity into it. I think where objectivity plays into astrology itself is saying like, we don't objectively know. <laughs> That's the only objectivity that there is with astrology. Although I might think about this later and change my mind. Um, and for sure, like I, I've been working with my own chart for a very long time and I get readings every single year and I always learn something new or a signature changes and shifts or my understanding of it does. But what I'm really thinking of when you're, when you're saying all these things is more along the lines of um, like societal structures and governance in terms of objective truth. So like I've been thinking a lot about how I don't think there can be one overarching spiritual system that like helps to unite the whole world. I don't think that that's realistic. And and if I break that down, it's because we have different relationships to each other versus uh, versus, uh, based on cultural norms, or we have different relationships based on the land that we live on and the agriculture that it supports and the, the trees and plants and all of that. And so an objective truth here in Seattle would be, I cannot make it through a winter without dry 
Like I have to have shelter to keep me out of the rain. Otherwise my body will wither and die. Right. Objective truth. Or like taking it to a more extreme, somebody who lives in the Arctic circle, they cannot live without fur lined clothing. Right. Whereas that objective truth, it's not true for somebody who lives somewhere else. Um, and so then I think of like, you know, crises facing the earth right now. And my partner and I have this conversation all the time because he thinks that globalism is the answer. Right. And I'm like, no, globalism's bullshit because it, you can't like, it has to be based on like the little microcosm of where you're living because there's all these different variables. Um, but I also hear what you're saying in, in terms of the way that objectivity helps us to orient to our experience, right? There has to be some kind of like core mechanism that is holding us down as we like hurdle through space at millions of miles an hour on a ball that's somehow like holding us in. Um, and what I think about there is more the way that the ego functions, like the ego as a structure of the psyche which is not like the central, it's not the central function. It's not supposed to be. We have so many parts to our psyches, but the ego is the part that helps us to like orient to our experiences by giving us an identity structure. So like, I am Amanda. I am an astrologer. I am the daughter of Susan. And this helps me to orient to my experience by giving me something that is like a core truth of myself. The issue there being that ego identity is also open to changing, right? So then I wonder about things. I don't know if things can be objectively true indefinitely. Um, and I also accept that I'll never know. Probably. Unless I do. I don't know. Isn't it objectively true that anyone who goes to the Arctic needs fur-lined clothing or its equivalent, or anyone who's in Seattle in the winter needs dry? Because the same will uh, happen to all of us who are in any of those situations at any one time. There's a, to me, there's a certain constancy to all of that. There's a, there's a coherence. It's as follows. You know, I don't. I, I know there are people who go, you know, swimming in in you know, they break the ice to go swimming in the winter. That's fine. And I don't, I don't do that. And I don't think I can, and I don't want to, but if I'm going to spend any time someplace, then I have to, if I'm going to spend some time in the equatorial regions, then I need cool. That That's just going to be there. That, that's just part of the deal. And to me, that's, that's an objective reality that must be dealt with regardless of, when I was born, I was aware my planets are aligned or whatnot. There are just some physical constraints that, that show up. And I think I think there's sometimes helpful places to start thinking and reflecting upon how, how we understand ourselves and the world around us. I think that's a good point, but uh, to Amanda's point about how objective truths can change, somebody could come along and say, well, I don't think that's true. I think humans could live in the Arctic Circle without um, fur or the equivalent, and then they would have to prove it, right? I mean, they would have to go and do it, and and they may be an extraordinary case, and then that objective truth will will change. So there's... I was not I was not trying to make a strong case for there being a specific objective truth. Just that there is something we against which we measure our stories about that's objectively true. Like we, we have to um be able to cor- ver- corroborate or to validate the claims that we make. And to do that we have to refer to something. And that might just be experience. Like objective truth may be just experience, pure experience, like William James says uh, about consciousness. It's just pure. But nonetheless, that is the measure. That is the the reference point. And maybe the reference point changes or how we talk about it changes. But 
um, I think I'm trying to argue against the implicit solipsism and that would be entailed if truth were purely a function of su subjectivity and specifically the, the particular articulations of, of subjectivity or intersubjectivity that we, we may want to come up with. But at the cosmic, then at the cosmic level, like Aurobindo with supermind sort of projecting itself through overmind, higher mind, illumined mind into, a, into physical reality through this, and this is a whole totally different conversation, but he, I think would, you know, he, he's saying that, well, any reality could be created by, by supermind. Um, but we don't experience ourselves or we may not experience ourselves as a supermind because we identify with derivative um, aspects of the one true, you know, reality. So that's just as, that, I think that's a bit of field from, from, from this. I'm, I'm reminded of um, Ed, Eddington, I think he was an astronomer, but he was talking about, um, he said an elephant sliding down a hill. I've used this example before. An elephant sliding down the hill, you can measure the incline of the hill, the weight of the elephant, um, the velocity, but that fails to capture the poetry of an elephant sliding down a hill. Hmm. So I think there are different truths that Eddington was pointing to, and, and those are all marvelous that we can gather objective data. But even the objective data that we gather is not totally objective. Someone had to come along and make that an important thing to do. And I think that's the why I'm, and you mentioned earlier, objective correlative um, theory of poetry. That actually comes from T.S. Eliot. He talked about the objective correlative and wrote a lot of poetic theories around the objective correlative. Later in his life, he was asked about that. And he said he had no idea what he was talking about when he used objective correlative. Um, so he had sort of changed in his poetic career about the vocabulary that he used previously. So I'm just saying we have different kinds of truth. And when we subordinate one kind of truth and make another truth um, better than or more important than, we end up, I think, um, missing the point to a lot of our experience, like the poetry of an elephant sliding down a hill. So uh, I believe we're all coming from uh, these kinds of different kinds of myths and stories and, um, you know, Buddhist, Christian, Hindu, and we're uh, and the clash of these different myths, I believe, the rational mind has emerged out of. And the Greeks were the first to notice because they were seafaring people and traveled all over the world. Hey, this group of people has this myth. This group of people has this myth. We have this myth. Which myth is the right myth? And then all of a sudden, the rational mind started to emerge because of these clashes. And um, I believe we're it's still in the midst of that. And I think it's ongoing part of our lived experience. I think we can do it better than we're doing now, though. We can always get better. Well, this has been a delightful experience. I don't know how long you guys normally go, but I need to wrap up in the next couple minutes. Um, we usually go a couple hours, so we're, it's time to wrap up. Okay. We go, yeah, we go two hours, and, and I don't know about the rest of you, but then I drink <laughs> and, and absorb everything and, and you know. Then I go to sleep and I dream and begin a new day. Great. What do you drink? That's whiskey and beer. <laughs> yeah. I'm old. I'm old. old I'm an old, old soul. Old school. <laughs> old school. Old soul. <laughs> I drink whiskey. Not you're the beer. Also a, you're also a rider, aren't you, Mark? A uh, what? Are you also yeah. a I think there's a relation between whiskey and, and writing. Yeah. I actually, yeah, at the That's beginning, I, I mentioned this, this uh, 
woman's Sabine Lucas. And, and my review that I wrote of her, I, I wrote a fictional uh, piece, like what would, what would her theory look like in, in my existence right now with someone I know? Like, how can I make sense of past lives in a, a, in a life of a real person? And it was quite fun. That's kind of what I do in writing fiction is, is take it to take theories and, and, you know, go backwards and forwards and, and try and make some sort of story out of it. I write my own myths, if you will. Uh, and and maybe the whiskey, beer, and stuff helps. Campfires help, Marco. You know. Whiskey is an integral part of my writing process. There you go. <laughs> I understand. But also something that just keeps popping into my mind, I don't know if it's related to what you were just saying or not. When it comes to objectivity, I think that the most important thing I can think of when it comes to objective truth is an openness to being wrong. Right. So there's a humility rather than a hubris. That seems really important. Um, that our culture seems to be lacking because we're so afraid of humiliation, right. Which is the extreme. End Absolute, of absolutely. 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 Well, we're afraid of being humiliated, but we're also afraid of the chaos that results when objective truth doesn't hold. You know, we didn't talk about the two suitors, but I think that if we were to do a part two at some point, uh, we could go into the the dynamics of of, of that. Oh, um, I think we were we were talking about that, but yes, we can do a part two. I th I think we've all got uh, two suitors within us, uh, and I think we each of us has been um, presenting that, perhaps performing it in this conversation. Um, I think that's sort of what our, our, our epistemological shadow is all about. Hey, I'm polyamorous. I have more than two suitors. <laughs> <laughs> okay. On that intellectually note. polyamorous environment. In polyam intellectually polyamorous friendly uh, yeah. here, I, I believe. <laughs> Um, so that's Thank cool. That, that's an evolution perhaps of, of the two suitors, <laughs> multiple suitors. I know you have to go, Amanda. Thank you so much for sharing your knowledge with us. It's been a very You're welcome. Yeah. Yeah. Really appreciate it. It's very helpful. It was, it was sure. fun. Thank you. Yeah. All right. I'll see y'all later. All right. Bye-bye. Cool. Good to see you.